With the revelations of powerful men abusing their roles in workplaces, there is momentum to create real change around sexual harassment. Lynn Farley, thanks for coming in to give us some historical context. You first used the term sexual harassment in public in 1975 at a hearing by the New York Human Rights Commission. How did you learn this was such a widespread experience for so many women? Uh, it's, I was teaching at Cornell University and I had a, a, a mixture of co-eds from all over the country. And I was teaching a 15 credit field study course on women and work. And I was gonna be putting these kids out in the field with welfare mothers and union workers and give them a taste of what it was like, what it would be like to the people that they would, quote, be administering to later on. And I started getting nervous because I thought, well, I wonder what their work experience is. We're gonna be with working women. So I did a little consciousness raising in which they talked about their work experience. And every single one of those kids, I had 15 kids from all over the country, had already had an experience of either being fired or leaving a job because of sexual harassment. Of course, we didn't have a name for it. So what they said was, oh, he hit on me and he just wouldn't take no for an answer. Or, you know, the guy was just a sexual snake. <laughs> I mean, it, it, the language that we used. And I walked out of the room and I thought, oh, my God, this is an issue. And I just became like someone possessed. Every woman I met, you know, I would say, by the way, has anything like this ever happened to you? And almost invariably the woman would go, oh, honey, have you got all day? <laughs> you <Wow. know? laughs> How many time, you know, how many experiences do you want to hear about? And um, so it just went from there, and it was like a snowball. And then someone told me that there was a woman named Carmita Wood who had gone as far as she could go in the secretarial pool. At Cornell. Yes, at Cornell, and had been harassed by a famous, very famous scientist at Cornell. And then she had been turned down for unemployment insurance. So we got together. And I said, we will appeal the unemployment ruling, but would you be willing to be a spokesperson for the issue? Uh, be willing to talk about your experience. And I said, and I don't want an answer right away. I want you to go home and think about it because you're gonna become very famous. You're gonna be notorious. Um, you're gonna be the, one of the first women really talking about this issue. And so she went home, talked with her family and made the decision yes and came back and that was sort of the beginning. We did appeal her unemployment claim. We lost. We did a speak out and um, I presented the testimony at the New York City Human Rights Commission and Aidan Nemi from the New York Times was there. I was going to ask you, the Times covered that hearing, and what happened after the article came out? Well, Enid Nemi came up, and I mean, people were sort of blown out because, and I was very scared, I have to admit, my hands were shaking when I read my testimony because the way we had dealt with sexual harassment up to this time was by making a joke. Oh, she's just an old maid, she doesn't know how to take a joke, what's the big deal? Come on, lady, what's your problem? And so I thought, well, they could start laughing. People could start, you know, minimizing this. But uh, Eleanor Holmes Norton picked up on it right away. And Enid Nemi, who was in the room, picked up on it right away. And Enid Nemi said, I want to go back and talk to the powers that be at the Times, but I want to come up to Ithaca and do a story. And I said, great. And that's what she did. She did the first nationally syndicated story that used the phrase sexual harassment of women on the job. And... And then there was no putting the genie back in the bottle. It was, we got letters from all over the country. People sent quarters, dimes, dollars, $5 bills. Women said, I can't believe somebody's finally talking about this. It was an incredible outpouring. And of course, that was very energizing for us. I mean, it was just like, we were on the right track. We were doing something valuable and we just kept going from there. What were some of the most egregious experiences that women told you about on the job? Um, you know, it ran the whole gamut, and p people tend to focus on uh, what amounts to rape or what amounts to a quid pro quo like prostitution. I'll give you the job if you'll sleep with me or you'll let me, f you know, you give me a blow job in the back room in the afternoon. Um, but one of the stories I remember was a woman who said every morning her boss came in and he said, Hiya tits, how they hanging today. 
And after a while, she just couldn't take it anymore. Um, a lot of women, I think, experience what we consider lesser forms of harassment are actually not lesser forms of harassment. Um, it builds up over time and it's stressful. That's why the word harassment, I think, is very critical. We could have, I could have called it many other things, um, but what got the closest, as far as I could see, was to say sexual harassment. So it, go, it includes the verbal denigration, it includes the kind of sexist commentary that just never stops. Then it goes on to touching and feeling and to more sexual assault and rape. It goes the whole gamut. Why was it actually important to give a name to this? Well, to how could it? you, you know, we had all been experienced, women had been experiencing this, but because we didn't have a common name, we weren't connecting with one another. So, you know, Jane over here was calling it one thing and Susan over here was calling it another and somebody else saying something else. And it was very clear to me when I walked out of that classroom, we had to have a name. We had to know, we all had to be able to communicate. And in order to do that, we had to have a name for this behavior. And it took me quite a while. It took me about two weeks. I mean, I brainstormed with everybody and it was very hard to, to kind of pin it down. I don't know why, you know, was it intimidation? Was it blackmail? Was it extortion? Was it, um, and finally, I think sexual harassment came as about as close as we were going to get. Um, your book came out and a documentary was based on it. You were on all the major news outlets talking about sexual harassment. What reactions were you getting at the time from media and from corporations? Um, you know, <clears throat> everyone treated it as a groundbreaking work, which it was. Uh, so I would arrive for the TV show and the woman producer would come out and say, oh, Lynn, we're so happy to have you here. It's very groundbreaking work. It's very important. But, you know, and then she would use the name of the male host, Johnny or Jack or Jim or Merv, are going to appear to attack you because we think that's better box office. And I said, OK, you know, because I just was trying to get the information out there. Um, but over time, it got hard. You know, when you can't defend yourself, when you just have to, you know, I would just smile and let them you know, say their inanity, really. And then I would just try and talk to the audience and try and get the information out there because that was what I really cared about. Um, there was only one show that I ever walked off. <laughs> really? Yeah. Um, it was in Chicago and um, it was a radio show. And um, the man was very nice and very polite and you know said it was groundbreaking work and then two young girls called in and they were working at a fast food restaurant and they were being you know they had to put out they had to have sex with the boss in order to keep their jobs and they were really upset and wanted help and i could hear that and this when they when the call ended the guy called them little whores he said on the air on the air he said those little whores what do they think they're doing? And I just went, whoa. You know, you can say whatever you want to me, but you cannot insult young women who call in to this show because I am appearing on it. And I said, just took the microphone off and I said, we're done. And I walked off. And I thought, oh, I'm going to hear from McGraw Hill. They're going to be so upset. Everybody's going to be. Because one of the things they tell you when you go on tour is don't leave the person with any dead air time. You know, be a good guest. This probably. is your publisher. Right. Mm -hmm. So I was a very bad guest. And I left him with about 10 minutes of dead air time. And, but it didn't work out that way. McGraw Hill, when I talked to them, they said, oh, sales are soaring again. <laughs> you know, can you do it again tomorrow? <laughs> Going to do a mic drop somewhere. Right. Yeah. What changes did you start to see in terms of laws and federal agencies? Well, you know, the EEOC was very responsive. Um, this is the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. That's the, yes, and Eleanor Holmes Norton had, was not head of the EEOC then, but shortly afterwards she was, and she was on it. And uh, women started filing cases with the EEOC. I talk about Diane Williams in the book, who was the first woman, black woman, to sue the Justice Department. She won her case. Uh, a male attorney, Michael Hausfeld, took her case. These were very early days, and um, 
her case was really, I think, significant, um, monumental maybe. Um, so we had those isolated cases and then we began to see class actions. Uh, Mitsubishi, I think it was 350 women signed on and they got a nice settlement. Um, in the beginning, the settlements were small. They got larger and larger and larger as time went on. Um, you began to see case law, you began to see uh, a development of um, an understanding that it was a kind of sex discrimination, sexual harassment. It was just as valid as sex discrimination and should be treated with seriousness and could be litigated under the prevailing sexual, sexual discrimination law. Um, so there was a steady development of, of legal um, cases. You wrote in the book in 1978 that, I'm quoting you, until we understand how sexual harassment has been used to keep women in line and the way this coercion interacts with women's employment conditions, women will remain an exploited underclass. So here we are 40 years later, <laughs> clearly this is still a systemic problem. Yes. Why? Because we've, you know, it's taken me 40 years to understand what we need to do to stop sexual harassment in the workplace. It's very simple. We need parity between men and women in positions of authority in the workplace. If a man looks around and he sees nothing but other men that he has to report to, he's gonna go ahead and sexually harass somebody if that's what he's inclined to do. But if he looks around and he sees, oh, four men and six women that he has to report to, he's not gonna harass. It's just that simple. And we have to really look at who we are putting in positions of authority, supervisor, manager, within the workplace. Almost invariably, they are male. They are not female. And that's what's keeping sexual harassment in place. I don't care, you know, Gretchen Carlson got 20 million. It isn't gonna stop sexual harassment. You wrote an opinion piece in the New York Times a few months ago saying, I coined the term sexual harassment corporations stole it. What do you mean? Well, you know, um, a lot of corporations jumped on it, or slowly over time that they did. Um, there was a movie, The Workplace Hustle, that was done that uh, was shown by virtually every Just major corporation. based on your book? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. very, every major corporation in America did a training utilizing The Workplace Hustle, which was based on sexual shakedown. And um, so lip service was given to the idea this is not okay, but it was lip service. And it was almost like a, some guy told me it was almost like a training seminar of how to do it. Oh, Great. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're laughing about it, but when he told me that, I mean, I remember thinking, oh my God, you know. So, so guys are going and they're thinking, oh, this is what, oh, I didn't think of that before. Oh, I didn't have that idea, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, so, you know, again, until we see parity between the sexes in positions of authority, we're not going to stop it. And you can have all the training in the world, and it is not going to eradicate sexual harassment. But what happened was the corporations sort of took the phrase over, and they sanitized it. And the way they sanitized it, and the media is complicit, everybody is complicit, is we don't really talk about the down and dirty details of what sexual harassment means. So we have this kind of nice phrase, but what does it mean? Does it mean blowjobs in the afternoon in the back room? Uh, does it mean the manager who likes to do it on top of the boardroom table? Uh, is it the woman who has to crawl under the desk to give the guy a blowjob while he's talking on the phone? I mean, the stories that I've heard <laughs> And that have come out. Are just yeah. unbelievable. But we need to say the details. And we need to stop just relying on that phrase. We need to hear the nitty gritty details of this. I got an award, um, I think, somewhere between the hardback and the paperback by the AFL-CIO. And they flew me out to Michigan to present me with an award. And they were going to put a, a clause against sexual harassment in their union contracts, which was great. At the same time that I was there, three black women came to me and told me some of the most vicious, ugly harassment stories I had heard, uh, including feces being put in their locker at work. I mean, this was ugly stuff. And um, 
They were management. They weren't union, and nobody was about to help them. Who? Well, you bring up a good point. Who are the missing voices in the most recent revelations well, about sexual harassment? And abuse? Yeah, I mean, clearly the missing voices are the working class women, the women who do most of the work in America today. Um, actresses in government, even some academia and publishing, those are the voices that we've heard from. We haven't heard from the waitress. We haven't heard from the factory worker. We haven't heard from the domestic worker or the agricultural worker. Although someone told me yesterday that uh, a Latino organization wrote a letter in support of the women who were coming out in Hollywood. And I was so excited to hear that because if we can have an alliance between the Latina farm workers and the actresses in Hollywood, this will be revolutionary because you have women without access to media hooking up with women who do have access to media and they can support and help each other. Well, as um, you and many others have said, we focused on attention on women of privilege, especially in Hollywood, but the recent Golden Globe Awards, many of these women use that privilege to call for change, yes. to include other women right. in that call. So it seems like that could be a key way to move right. this forward. Yeah, I, um, <clears throat> I also think that we need to, uh, there is a tendency um, by some people to say, well, black women have it worse, or uh, working class women have it worse. Um, I would like to sort of see a stop to that. I think women across the board, whether they're professional actresses or they are domestic workers, get sexually harassed. Um, let's not bring in all the usual ways that we divide ourselves, and let's start thinking about how we can unite, how we can come together. All women are sexually harassed. Um, and I don't think any one group has it especially worse than any other group. Um, and I'm hoping that we can see uh, a unity movement start to form that would ha take concrete steps towards stopping harassment. So that if a woman is up for an, a promotion, she's going to be a manager, she's going to be a supervisor, let's let women unite behind her to see that she gets that job because that's just one more person that is going to prevent sexual harassment. The media has provided a megaphone for all these stories that have come out, a platform for victims to share what happened. But what does that say about the systems that we're supposed to be addressing these issues like HR departments or people in the organizations who apparently knew about some of these predators for years. Oh yeah, it, uh, that's the whole thing. HR departments were a failure. Uh, sometimes it seemed as if my book simply created another little job niche <laughs> <laughs> for middle-class women to be the sexual harassment officer in the HR, but she didn't have any power. What was she going to do? Was she going to take on the management? And, you know, you come to her with a story, and she's caught in the middle. She is sympathetic to your story, but she's got to report to management, and they're the people that employ her. So it really never went very far, and uh, I don't think it ever will go very far. I don't think that um, HR departments are the answer. Um, we need a women's union. We need a national working women's association with some teeth. Yeah. You know, the women you first met at Cornell had nearly all, as you said, left jobs yeah. uh, because of harassment. Decades later, with all the recent revelations we've heard, many women say as well they moved on. Some of them left a profession entirely and abandoned their career goals. So what do you think would truly change that and, and keep those opportunities open so women can stay in the workplace I think in if, advance? if women can continue to support each other, then women will not have to leave jobs. But when you look around and you're the only one, mm -hmm. and you, uh, did you see the movie with Charlie Theron about the, uh, she was a minor? I've wanted to see that, I know which one you're talking about. Yes. Is it, it based on a real story? Yes, it yeah. is, and those women were viciously sexually harassed. The other thing that you need to remember, and that movie points this up, is sexual harassment has been used by employers, um, in two ways to kind of oppress working women. One is it keeps them out of non-traditional job areas. So you see that in the movie about the miners. 
the women are trying to do a traditional male job area and the men don't want them there and they're fighting and sexual harassment is a major technique that men traditionally use when women are coming into a job area where they don't want them. Within the traditional female job sphere, it is used to depress wages and to keep unionization out. So you see this in, uh, with young kids, you see it in the fast food industry. It is almost like a, um, employers almost y turn a, a blind eye because it keeps turnover high and they don't have to worry about unionization. They don't have to worry about uh, someone being there for a year or so maybe deserving a raise. No, you've only been here six months. Well, it's because the manager was harassing you and you had to get out, but they're not gonna pay attention to that. It works in their favor. You got a PhD in psychology and you went on to do completely different things after you wrapped up your book tours. Why? You know, I really got tired of being the sexual harassment lady. Um, it was kind of the height of the women's movement and wherever I went, uh, somebody would say, oh, she wrote the book about sexual harassment and whoever had an ax to grind about the women's movement would sort of zero in on me and I would sort of like, oh, please, oh, please. And, uh, I couldn't put it down on job applications, you know. Um, as soon really? as they saw that s sexual, I wrote a book about sexual harassment of women on the job, I was just labeled a troublemaker. I was a no good Nick. I couldn't even, you know, it got to the point where somebody would ask me, oh, what's the book about? And I would say, oh, women and work. <laughs> and, you know, I should have. For the internet, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> I should have seen this coming because. Um, I was backpacking after the manuscript had been vetted and edited and we were going to press. You know, there's a little lag time and I didn't have any money, I didn't have anything and so I went backpacking and um, I forget where I was, it was sort of at the end of the summer, it was pouring rain and I had my thumb out, I was just like desperate to get a ride and this older man and his son picked me up and they put me in the middle. <laughs> And without thinking, this was my first experience of what was to come. They, they said, you know, you talk. And I said, well, I wrote a book. Oh, well, what is it called? Sexual Shakedown, The Sexual Harassment of Women on the Job. <laughs> Within three minutes, I was back out of the car, <laughs> standing in the rain at the side of the road going, oh, dear. I mean, he said, the, the father said, you're one of them libbers? <laughs> and I went, oh, not exactly. <laughs> they made wanna, you get out? I didn't wow. want to get thrown back out. <laughs> um, you've now retired to Santa Fe. Although you've, you've been in the media a lot the last few months because of the current zeitgeist. So do you have any interest in returning to this topic now? Yes, I do. I do. Um, not only returning to the topic, but I think we need to really look at the other side of the coin. We, it's time for us to talk about the way we socialize men and the way men, so many men, I mean, let's put it this way. If we have victims in the numbers that we say we have, and I believe we do, we have harassers in equal numbers. But we don't talk about that. We don't talk about the way we socialize men to abuse women and children or to think it's their right to take advantage or exploit or abuse women and children. So I did my doctoral dissertation on, it's called The Secret World of Men. And I think it's time for that book to see the light of day. Well, Lynn Farley, thank you so much for coming and talking to us about this. Thank you, this. it was a pleasure.